Thank you very much. Well, I'll uh, try to make up for the time, but uh, the, um, uh, the story that I want to tell you is, uh, is in fact, uh, uh, rather simple uh, in words, in the sense that uh, there is a mystery in, uh, in each of our head. It's uh, about three pounds of meat that gives rise to thought, feelings, memories, intentions, pretty much all of our inner life. And the one key thing, if you have to remember only one difference between axons and dendrites, please remember this. Axons are huge compared to dendrites. So in scale, this very dendrite here is actually the, the launch of the same axon as what you see here. So these are actually the input tree and the output tree of the same cell. And this dendrite, this input here, the scale is about this size relative to this axon. Which means that when you put this in the perspective of the brain, if you put a big brain around this, it means that the most of the road, most of the path between two neurons, most of the distance is traveled by the axons. So dendrites are local receivers, and axons are long-distance senders. However, dendrites are smarter, so to speak. So dendrites do all the computations. So dendrites integrate very complex signals. They receive all sorts of signals throughout their 10,000 contacts, and they continuously adapt to their signals. So they're incredibly classic. So in a way, if you want to divide the function between axons and dendrites, axons communicate, and dendrites integrate and compute. And uh, maybe it goes with that, but uh, dendro uh, axons uh, use a relatively simple code, which is zeros and ones. So either they're sending a signal, and the signal is one, or they're not sending a signal, and the signal is zero. So in that way, they're a little similar to digital computers, although that's pretty much the only way in which they're similar to digital computers. So that means that because of the trees, there are branches and bifurcations. When a signal starts from the cell body of a neuron, it starts traveling down the trunk, and at every bifurcation, boom, it duplicates. One, one in both directions, at another bifurcation, boom, another one, one. At the end, you have 10,000 ones, reaching another 10,000 neurons, right? In contrast, the dendrites have strong signals, like spike, like the axon, but they also have very quiet, soft signals. So they can do all sorts of singing from very soft to very loud. They don't just have ones and zeros. And because the branching structure of the trees, of the axons and the dendrites, defines and determines the connections, okay, I'm going to claim, and I'm going to try to convince you in the next 20 minutes or so, that these trees actually determine and define the space of what can be learned. Okay, so I'm going to take a leap from Bring it to mind here, and I'm going to equate the two. Okay. So in order to do that, I have to put a foot back into philosophy for a second and make some of the assumptions uh, overt and explicit. And the first assumption uh, is, uh, I would say, almost trivial, although it's very uh, seldom stated. But I would say almost everyone would agree that mental states are patterns, both in space and time of electric activity in the brain. So the signals are little spikes of electric activity and the propagation of this electric activity in, in the brain and there is plenty of experimental evidence and when activity goes away, your consciousness goes away and bang. So mental states are spatial temporal patterns of activity. The reverse is not necessarily true. You can have activity and then not be conscious. Uh, but for sure, when you're conscious of something, there is some pattern of activity that goes on into your brain. And here is the first step of reasoning that I would, I would uh, uh, encourage you to, uh, uh, to uh, think about. So after telling you how beautiful these trees are, how complex these trees are, I'm uh, schematizing this uh, uh, neuron with uh, just a stick. So that's very, uh, very simplifying. Imagine just a beautiful tree instead. So the blue stick on the left is the input or the dendrite. The red stick on the right is the axon or the output. That little twig that comes out of the blue is an input of the dendrite, and that little ball that you have on the red is the little output. Okay, so that means if I put two neurons, that's a synapse right there, which is a point of contact between the red ball of the output and the blue twig of the input. And so a, a whole circuit of about 12 neurons would uh, look like something like this: there are some synapses here and there, and some neurons and connected. It's not all to all connected. Some neurons are connected to others, but not all to all. And this is obviously a cartoon. Very simple, with only 12 neurons and uh, just the same number of synapses or so. And the spatial temporal pattern of activity would look like something like this. Okay? 
So every flash that you see is like a spike that is traveling down the axon and activating the postsynaptic dendrites. Okay, so you can imagine that that will correspond to a mental state of an extremely simple animal. Okay. Now, the signals travel from one neuron to the other through the synapses. The synapses are the point of contact. Okay, so these connections in the network define what signals can propagate and therefore they constrain the spatial temporal patterns. For example, if you disconnect two neurons, the signal cannot pass from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. Very much like if you block intersection in the road, you're blocking traffic passing through that intersection. Okay? So as an extension, you can imagine that all of the patterns that you can instantiate in a network are given by the grid work of the, the mesh of roads. Okay? So the map of those roads gives the entirety of all the pattern of traffic that you could implement there. And uh, this is what in uh, neuroscience is called a connectome, or a full connectivity map of a nervous system. So the, entirety, the entire definition of all the synapses, all the, in the case of a human brain, thousand trillion synapses. And uh, 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 much of uh, the emphasis of the brain initiative uh, is to uh, develop technologies that could allow us to actually map uh, such wealth of information. So if all the connectivity of the network defines the mental state, so what, what one knows, what one can think of, that means when you learn something, it means that now you can think of something you could not think of before. So for example, if you learn the difference between axons and dendrites, maybe tonight you're going home and you're thinking, oh yeah, the axons are the output, the dendrites are the input. If you did not know that yesterday, you could not have possibly have had that thought, okay? That, that possibility was not there. So I'm claiming maybe synapses were formed in your brain, okay? So now you can have a pattern of activity that you could not have before. So in that logic, and I'm not the only one to think of this, there are many people thinking the same way, but learning is the formation of new synapses or elimination of new synapses in circuits of neurons. And that's a phenomenon called structural plasticity. So in that particular case before, if you see there are two more synapses that got formed out of that uh, little pattern of activity that I played before for you, and that might mean that after having that thought, this very simple animal now learn a new association, for example. And so creating a synapse, and there is a lot of evidence at this point, requires an experience, and by experience I'm not just meaning behaviorally, you could just sit on your chair and have an aha moment, have a thought, realize something, not telling anybody, not flinching, not twitching, just a purely internal point, and still learn something out of it, okay? So it's not something that you observe necessarily, it can be self-driven, but it's nonetheless a mental state. So almost any mental state, from sitting in class and listening to a professor, to having a thought or being creative, uh, are a process of learning in which new synapses are formed, and these are very fast, second-length occurrences. And yet, I would argue, if you put two individuals in exactly the same situation and you provide exactly the same stimuli, those two individuals will learn different things, typically. Okay? So I'm going to give you a few examples of that. But the point of that is that somehow the fact that you have activity is not in and by itself sufficient to form new synapses. There must be something more. You have a lot of activity during, during uh, normal mental processes in the brain, some synapses get formed, but not all the possible synapses. Why is that? What synapses get formed and what do not? And why I form some synapses and you form different synapses? So it seems to me that this is a possible way to explain why learning is known in psychology is gated by background information, which means you need to have a certain threshold of knowledge about a topic to learn more about that topic. I'll give you some examples. So if you are uh, familiar with campus and you notice, oh look, the Q bus now stops by the church in the campus entrance, that's it. Now you have a shortcut. The next day you're not going to slap all the way to Shenandoah Circle. You're going to go to the church to catch the bus, right? You learned it. Now if you are just visiting the campus, the first time you're seeing campus, you're a high school student considering whether to go to Mason, and that's the first time, that's just a church. So I'm not going to learn it. Right? You're, you're going to be over your head. And I have several other examples like that. If you are a good uh, music player, for example, you could look at the music score, immediately being able to either play or even hum the tune in your head. If you're a beginner uh, player, you might read the notes just as well. You might know what uh, the various notes are, but you will not be able to 
learn it uh, or imagine it. And uh, this is true anywhere from behavior, from uh, habits, to uh, higher cognition or, or theory or mathematics. So you could uh, look at the theorem. If you are mathematically versed, you might remember the proof the next day. And if you are not mathematically versed, uh, you might not. And that goes for sports. And uh, if you hear of a soccer result, you realize, oh, gee, that means in the brackets, oh, wow, that's what the team is in semifinal. Well, you know, if, if you do not understand the rules of the tournament, then you're out of luck that you're not going to learn. So somehow, the formation of synapses and learning appears to require more than just activity. And uh, I'm going to propose, and this is kind of the central tenet of the book, and a lot of the interesting consequences of the fun uh, reasoning comes after that. So I'm going to try to explain it. But it's a very, very, very basic principle that, that should be uh, uh, relatively easy to convince you of. Which means that in order for, two, 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 for a synapse, for two neurons to form a new synapse, for a presynaptic neuron to form a new connection to a postsynaptic neuron, it's physically necessary for the axon, for the output of the first neuron, to be proximal, proximal, physically proximal to the input of the other neuron. So if you have one axon here, or one dendrite here, that could be active at the same time. There is no way they can connect, right? Because they're far away in the brain. But if they're very near, they might make a synapse. And so I'd like to uh, tell a little personal story to explain as an example how this might work. And uh, uh, it was mentioned that I was born and raised in Italy. And in fact, I, I lived in Milan, a city, a very great city with uh, very low green. So I was a city boy. And uh, when I moved to DC, I, I, uh, to DC area, I lived in DC, so that didn't change. I was in an apartment building. And finally, I moved to the suburbia, and uh, uh, I loved it here. Uh, I bought a house and had a porch. Uh, so I uh, sat on my porch, and one of the first days I was sitting on this porch, uh, just enjoying the spring, uh, a beetle flew by, and it was buzzing. And the city boy, like I was, I was like, oh, gee, beetles buzz? I didn't know that. Uh, interesting. I, mean, I think I had seen beetles before, but uh, did not realize it. But anyway, this was not an emotional memory. It's not something I observed a hundred times. So it's not repetition. It's not shot. It didn't get stung by the beetle or anything. And honestly, I couldn't care less that beetles can buzz. But nonetheless, I still remember it. So I'm claiming that the new synapse was formed. And uh, here again, imagine that the representation of the beetle, the representation of the concept of buzzing is, is in the brain represented by many neurons together. Here I'm using so-called grandmother neurons, single neurons for single concepts, just for the purpose of illustration. I'm not claiming that's what the brain does. But imagine instead of having one neuron for beetle, one neuron for buzzing, imagine 1,000 neurons for each. But if I drew those, you would not see anything anymore. So in order for that synapse to be formed, it means that the action of buzzing have to have come in close proximity to the dendrites of beetle. And the answer is why? Why should the axon be there? Because you see, the axons are long, but every neuron only connects to 10,000 other neurons, which means the action of a single neuron is not invading the entirety of the brain. It's only invading some regions. So why is that axon there? Now keep in mind that you're trying to pack as many connections as possible in your brain, because that way you evolve them, right? You mate, you eat, you do all sorts of things that evolution likes. You survive better, in other words. So the reason that buzzing is here is because it's making connections with other neurons. That's what axons do. They travel to make connections. So what dendrites, what neurons, is this buzzing axon connecting to? So that should be an easy question to answer. It's like, well, what else do we know that buzzes? Right? So I don't know. Wasp, for example. We know. I knew already at that point that wasp buzz. And in fact, I knew lots of things that buzz. A lot of bugs that buzz, right? Flies, bees, bumblebees, all sorts of animals. And now, if uh, that axon was here because it was connected to us, now this next question is why was the neuron of beetle next to the neuron of wasp in the brain? And in fact, there is good experimental evidence for that, that there are animals areas in the brain, face areas within the animal areas, there are mammalian areas, bug areas, fish areas, they're all clustered together in the brain. Why is that? And the reason is exactly the same, which is there are lots of characteristics that are in common between these animals. So by putting these two neurons together, you're packing more connections without extending more cables. So now you have an, an axon, for example, of flying that is catching two birds with one stone, so, so to speak, in the sense of making two connections without having to travel in two different parts of the brain. Okay? So this actually provides a very nifty explanation of the fact that this could be the explanation of background information gain. 
So in other words, you're learning that buzzing can connect to beetle because it makes sense. Because there are lots of other things that have other properties in common with beetles that also buzz. So you're kind of extending your knowledge by a one trial learn. So luck has that you can represent this uh, set of relationships with some mathematics and that's always very lucky because when you can do that, then you can create computer models of that and you can test your hypothesis and see if it actually works computationally. And so we've created a, a model uh, over the years and now imagine that this is a graph of concepts and we in fact created, uh, experimented a graph of concepts by mining all the words from Wikipedia. There are many, many nouns and many, many adjectives and wanted to know not just the, uh, buzz, that beetles can buzz, which Wikipedia does know, uh, but also all sorts of things having to do with animals and other things having to do with uh, different concepts. I wanted to know if we were to create a model that knew, let's say it was a great expert of animals, knew 50% of all the possible things that you could know about animals. So that's a fantastic animal expert. That kind of model should be able to learn that beetles can buzz much better than you can learn other things. For example, a kumquat is sour sweet because this model maybe knows very little about fruit. But now, in contrast, if you create a model that knows 50% of all the possible properties of all possible fruit and knows very little about animals, now that model might learn a lot more easily that kumquats are sour sweet than that uh, uh, beetle can bones. And this is a little bit like the Mason student who can learn that the uh, Q-bus now stops by the church, or the math major who can now uh, learn to prove that square root of two is not a rational number, and uh, if you don't have that kind of expertise, one way or the other, uh, you cannot learn it just as easily. And uh, the model, in fact, uh, based on, on this formulation of this uh, equation that describe by solar degree constraints on learning, reflects just that massively that expert learning is a lot easier than novice learning. But very interestingly, it explains another much more interesting problem, and that is that normally when we learn something, we're not just seeing a beetle and just hearing the buzz. We are constantly bombarded with other information. So maybe I was eating ice cream. I'm not associating, I didn't learn that I, the ice cream was buzzing, even if those two perceptions came at the same time, just, just the same. And interestingly, there is no context for the fact that ice cream could buzz. But there is a lot of context for the fact that kumquat could be sour sweet, because other fruit can have taste. Right? And flying bugs don't have taste. Okay? So if you are now, instead of associating two terms, one word and one adjective at the same time, you give the model ten words and ten adjectives. Now combinatorially, we have all sorts of wrong combinations that can happen. And that's a lot more reflexive experience. Right? right now, if you try to capture what I'm saying, you might think, oh, maybe I'll have a cookie on the way out. You might be, oh, Jesus, this room is a little hot. Oh, wow, I have to start a lot tonight because tomorrow I have a test. You might have a lot of, of uh, thoughts, but in the end, all the right associations will be formed. Why? Because there is a right context. And so if you were to give at the same time this the contemporary uh, 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 pair of stimuli where you see a beetle, you hear a buzz, you eat a kumquat and you are tasting sour sweet, your brain will automatically, due to the shape of its arbors inside, associate the taste of sour sweet with the kumquat and the sound of the buzzing to the beetle for free. And this is, uh, in fact, uh, something that in artificial intelligence is a tough problem. It's called spurious learning. And uh, 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 artificial uh, algorithms and companies have rediscovered this rule uh, I don't know if you are an online shopper or if you even just use coupons, but typically the coupons that they send you uh, tend to be related to what you bought, right? So if you bought, uh, uh, you know, pet shampoo, uh, they will say, oh, look at this new color that we just, uh, you know, uh, are now selling. But if you, uh, you know, buy diapers, they might try to sell you diaper rash, right, uh, cream and stuff. And, uh, and so it, it wouldn't make sense to try to, uh, uh, randomly advertised. But uh, you know, if you look at a book at Amazon, they will say, oh gee, people who look at this book also look at these other books, and that is more likely to fit your interest. And it's exactly the same mechanism. So as I'm staring out of the window in my office, and this is a picture that uh, perhaps one of the people in the audience will remember, but uh, uh, it's a fall at the uh, backyard of the Prize Institute. And I'm contemplating the trees, and this to me works a lot like a 
a blackboard or a whiteboard because uh, I, I, I look at trees and I see neurons and I start to think about how these neurons could uh, work in networks and how to make connections. It slowly dawns on me that I could actually extend uh, this uh, brain-mind relationship where the activity patterns correspond to mental states and the connectivity that everyone is after, the so-called connectome, is whatever the organist has learned from the past. But the proximity between the branches, the proximity between the input and the output, that's the potential to learn from the future. It actually defines what you will learn given the experience that you have. And the beauty of that is that that continuously changes. Okay? So in a way, the contact, the actual contacts, are a history of your experience, and the proximity of the trees are a potential of your learning. And so I went on and tried to build models with a bunch of neurons. This is the uh, work of uh, one of my talented former PhD student, uh, Todd Gillac, who took a bunch of neurons that were recollected in the microscope and put that in the right, it's, there's a little too much light, but in the right uh, position in the atlas of the brain and the right orientation and tried to figure out which axons and which dendrites would overlap to figure out what kinds of mechanisms could underlie network learning. And uh, uh, I decided that virtual reality was not good enough, and we uh, teamed up with a very talented uh, uh, student in art, uh, Alice Quattrochi, and this is Todd Gillette, very carefully noticing that we're reflecting his virtual model carefully. And we put together a sculpture uh, made out of copper, so uh, conductive wire, which is apropos. This is now in the great room of the Chrysler Institute. Everyone is, is welcome to uh, uh, to visit. It's a, it's a fairly large size uh, sculpture and uh, uh, it has uh, representations of synapses of all types uh, reflected by colors. And uh, uh, when uh, we had the opening of uh, this sculpture, um, it was well received both uh, in terms of the beauty and the artistic rendering as well as the explanatory power. And I cannot show this picture without taking a, a second to uh, remember Harold Moritz, who is the uh, founder of the Krasnov Institute, who passed away last week and uh, has been a fantastic uh, uh, inspirational figure for uh, many of us in the Institute. Uh, but nonetheless, the key part of this uh, 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 picture is this student here, Rebecca Coleman, who is an experimentalist who is now working at NIH, who was then finishing her uh, PhD thesis and had for four years patched, uh, recorded experimentally with very fine electrodes, uh, neurons going from the intranet cortex that is about here to the hippocampus that is about here. And her advisor told her, you have to cut the slices at 45 degrees. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to record it. And Rebecca Coleman, as all skeptic scientists, tried to say, oh, I'm not going to believe my advisor, well, who does? Right? <laughs> and so I started cutting slices at all possible angles. And fair enough, nothing worked except 45 degrees. Right? And so it was like, wow, magic. She was right, I have no idea why. Right? And that was it. She worked for four years, accumulated data, was ready to graduate. And this is a freshman first year student, Sarah Hose, coming in the lab as Rebecca was leaving, saying, check it out, the whole fiber bundle is at 45 degrees. If you cut in any other direction, you're going to cut those axons. You're not going to record anything. So the only way that you can record that signal is if you cut the slice this way. And I love her face, right? And finally graduating, I was like, whoa! <laughs> so the next time you uh, take a walk in uh, Berkeley Park, uh, I would invite you to, uh, uh, to look up and uh, try to make up for the overlaps of those trees. And then uh, try to think that there are uh, hundreds of, tr of, of uh, 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 thousands of trillions, so in order to number, many more than the synapses themselves. And that's your potential to learn new things. Okay, you have many more overlaps between branches than actual synapses, which means that the world that you can learn, the world that you can come to represent in your head, is hundreds of times faster than the world, the whole repertoire of all possible thoughts that you can have at any one time. And uh, also remember that uh, for every mental state uh, that you can have, there is a reflection, and that's brain activity. And somehow the structure of that activity in your brain is a equivalent uh, completely as a structure of your mental state. Okay, So they are one and the same thing. And the uh, link between those are those trees that I've been telling you about. 
and the database that was mentioned in the work of many, many people throughout the world. But each of these little uh, droplets that you see here is a little tree. There are only 1,000 in this slide, and now there are more than 37,000 in the database and growing. So I will stop there, and I'll take questions if there are any. And if not, I'll be happy to hang out and chat. about the relationship between the topology, the structure, and the potential to learn uh, new things and to learn more complex things. Because when you said that these neurons have to be in spatial proximity in order for us to be able to sort of integrate a new concept, ooh, uh, a bit of buzzes, or something like that, well, a naive interpreter of that result would say, then why can't the brain have everybody talk to everybody? Uh, sure, you might have some spurious learning that way, but oh, you're going to be able to learn a whole lot of things. So is there any work that looks into what structures have that balance between expert learning, maximizing expert learning, and minimizing spurious learning? And is there any work that tries to summarize complexity of species as interesting metrics or properties of these connectomes, I believe you call them? It's a fantastic question. Uh, it's really a great question. And the answer is, is yes, uh, in fact, in, to most of the questions that you asked. But uh, 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 let me first say, if uh, all the neurons were connected to all other neurons, there would be two key consequences. The first is your head will be about a thousand times bigger than what it is right now. And if you think that's a cool idea, ask your mother how she felt. <laughs> because that's the limiting factor of the human size of the head, which is much bigger than other animals. And ultimately, uh, the labor uh, is, uh, is, well, we'll go back to the Old Testament and to the promise that God uh, made to Eve because of uh, her wanting to pass the hypothesis. Uh, however, I would, uh, uh, I would also claim that there is something more which is, if everything were connected to everything, so you would not have a filter. So yes, you learn a lot more, but you learn a lot of things that are not necessarily meaningful. So you would learn, oh, maybe the ice cream buzz. And, maybe, and you learn also maybe the beetle buzz. And you, know which, you don't know which is which. Now you don't know how to do predictions. Now you see ice cream, it's like, oh gee, I might get stung, you run away. That's not good evolutionary speaking, right? Whereas you, you know what, I got stung by a wasp last week, I see a beetle, I'm gonna move three steps away. And somehow, I think I'm going to evolve better, aside from the fact that my head is more manageable for my mom. <laughs> so, uh, uh, however, the question still is valid because uh, you asked about different species, but let me uh, spin the question with development. When babies are born, their uh, trees are actually much bigger, and they take advantage of that in space. The head is physically smaller, so the space to be covered is smaller, and uh, you have uh, almost all to all connectivity. It's not true, but the connectivity in newborn babies is, is 10 to 100 times greater than in adults. So the process of learning, I framed it into formation of synapses, but there is a lot of carving as well. So it's a little bit like sculpting, right? So at the beginning, you have a block of marble, and after five years of work, Michelangelo carves David. Now you could say, gee, you know, you had to throw away a lot of marble around here, but, well, gosh, you got David out of it. Right? It's certainly more beautiful, more meaningful than that kind of block that you had before. And a little bit the carving of connectivity is this, and it, the, the price that we pay, but probably computation is a good price to pay, is uh, uh, the fact that there are some things that you cannot learn, even if they might be true. Now, all of this is only true for one trial learning, which are these neutral, non-repetitive things. We, we can also learn things in different ways, right? There is an emotional system, so if you, are, you know, if, you, if you try something, you like it a lot, or you dislike it a lot, you get hurt, for example, you're learning in different ways that do not require overlaps. So there are different circuits and different uh, 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 communication mechanisms in the brain that completely uh, shortcut this requirement of trees. And the other thing is that by repetition, uh, you can learn things by simply uh, repeating your stimulus or your motor command a thousand times uh, over, right? And uh, so there are time scales. This is something that constrains only, only uh, the neutral one trial, very fast learning that occurs in our cognitive lives. 
And with respect to the last question that you asked, I'm trying to keep them all in mind, but the last question was, there are different parts of the brain that specializes for, for and the answer is yes. So not only there are different parts of the brain, but also they are plastic or not plastic at different ages. So in a newborn baby, the visual cortex is learning how to recognize edges. Okay, new, new, newborn babies do not recognize objects, just like adults. They learn to recognize edges, okay? And now we adult, that part is no longer plastic because what a straight line is, is gonna stay a straight line for the next seven years, okay? We're gonna change the definition of a straight line in the world. However, there are other parts of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex, and other plastic areas, one of my favorite is the hippocampus, that keep plastic with this rule on for the entirety of the lifespan of the animal, of the mammals at least. And this appears to be true for all mammals that have been studied from mice to primates to uh, carnivores all the way to humans. Uh, the story is not super clear yet for invertebrates and for uh, like flies and worms, for example. I hope I didn't miss any of the questions I've asked. But... Any more questions? Yes? So I'm seeing some similarities between uh, sure neurons and trees, so our brain and the world. Are you familiar with the Gaia hypothesis? The which hypothesis? The Gaia hypothesis. Yeah. Sort of uh, this idea that this, this world is a brain in and of itself, since it creates intelligent organisms. Do you see any relation, or what do you, what do you think about that? Could this world be intelligent in and of itself? It's, sort of like it's very interesting. So I think that in order to answer that, that question uh, uh, properly, what actually needs a theory of what intelligence is, and uh, in a way that process theory that I've been putting forward here is that the connectivity sets the constraints of what can be learned. We could define that as intelligence. Uh, and there are more elaborate theories. And ultimately, you have to look at the structure of the information flux in the network. So you have to define in what sense the brain, you know, the, the world is an intelligent area. There is a, 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 a many movies that try to create uh, stories uh, around it. And, uh, um, enchanted forest, so to speak, that we're thinking. Uh, but certainly there are other hypotheses in, uh, in different branches of science that show that networks in general can display intelligent behavior. So swarms of animals behaving as a network can act as an uh, integral uh, intelligence or metabolic networks, gene networks, protein networks, relationship networks can act in certain ways. Learning, for example, changing the shape of the network through dynamics and so forth. Uh, I think that when people looked at the kinds of structures and so forth, there are some commonalities with the brain, like all these networks are small world networks, but uh, so are hubs and airports and so forth, so it's not necessarily telling. And I think that we simply don't really have enough data to say whether there is an actual similarity there. With respect to the tr trees of the nerve cells being very similar to uh, trees of uh, botany, uh, the, the only one key striking difference is the difference between the thickness and the length. So if you were to magnify a neuron that is, say, the size of your thumb in your brain, and you were to enlarge it to the size of an oak tree, for example, uh, the, the entire trunk of that oak tree will be about the thickness of a toothpick, right? Whereas an oak tree is, you know, the trunk is this thick. So, uh, and, and that's how you can pack as much uh, uh, mass and uh, cable and length in the brain. Uh, but uh, the, the, the reason of that is that it's driven by connectivity, pretty much. That's your fitness function, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, we just see a few words about learning and memory. Uh, these days, uh, one can hear quite a bit about memory not necessarily being really held uh, at the, uh, in the neurons, but uh, somewhere else yes. among the neurons. Yes. So there, there are theories. There is a very classic, very famous uh, physics theory that uh, memory uh, is stored in the strength of the connections, and that learning is an alteration of the strengths of the connections. And uh, uh, I would say that uh, the large amount of evidence that's been accumulated in the past 10 years in neurobiology shows that uh, synapses are actually dynamic, and the formation and elimination of synapses, both during wake time and sleep, uh, is what correlates with experience and learning. So in the theory that I'm espousing in this book, which is probably a simplification, so the story is probably not 100% like this, uh, but the theory I'm presenting is that memory is a set of connections. So your set of memory is your connectivity. 
And uh, learning is a change in that set of connections. Okay, so that's, that's a, the equation there. And as all super simplification, it's probably the first order of a Tiller series of better and better approximations, so to speak. Uh, but uh, uh, in that notion, the change in synaptic weights, the change in the strengths of those connections. So if you have a connection, it might be stronger or less strong, that might reflect uh, the facility to retrieve a memory, right? So there could be something that you know very well. So after you're finally admitted to George Mason University, you become a student, you learn where Fenwick Library is, and after a week, if your friend says, oh, where is Fenwick Library? Uh, yeah, uh, that direction. So you can retrieve it, it's a correct answer, but it might take an effort, right? And when you're a senior, and you've been at Mason for four years, and you've gone to Fenwick Library and back to the dorm one gazillion times, where's the library there? You know, like, bang, it's already there, this piece of information. So to me, the fact that the synapses are there give you the capability to retrieve a memory, and the strength of the synapse give you the facility to retrieve that memory, so to speak. Yes? So what does your future research hold for you? What is the what? Your future research hold for you. Um, so the, uh, the one extremely exciting um, Time is that we now are at a point where we are going to have the data that are needed to test a lot of these hypotheses. Okay, so uh, uh, a lot of the um, uh, new technologies, both in terms of uh, microscopy and uh, tissue processing and uh, uh, biotechnologies as well as uh, engineering that are being developed now allow interrogation, not only but also. Uh, direct intervention on the neural circuit. So I would like to be able to directly test the relationship between brain and mind in an experimental fashion. And I think there are two uh, elements that are needed. One is experiments, and those are in a way uh, uh, typical scientific approach of uh, reductionism. So you can exclude possibilities by doing experiments. And the other one is computer simulations which is almost complementary, it's constructionist, and you can test in principle models. So you go all the way down to the bricks, if you like, and then you erect your building back up. And I think that the consequences of those can be twofold, uh, the, the immediate consequences. One is that there is uh, going to be tremendous uh, uh, biomedical applications. A lot of the burden of medicine these days is on um, brain, brain disease. Uh, aging, as we cure other diseases, we become older and we start losing uh, our minds, um, and uh, uh, and the second one is in the uh, complement, which is uh, intelligent machines. So computers are already faster and much more precise and reliable than brains, uh, but yet they cannot do a lot of the computation that human brains do, such as empathy, for example. And uh, I think that there is no reason for that. It's not that the you know it's not that the electricity cannot flow through the computer. It's just that we haven't figured out the right architecture. And uh, um, I think that that's a, a, a very exciting prospect of uh, combining uh, both the experimental and the computational aspect. Yeah. All right. One more. Yes. So you were, I think I might be saying this wrong, but I think you were saying that learning occurs when two dendrites are closer to each other. Uh, or when when it, the axon of one neuron is close to the dendrite of another neuron. Are there ways to branch the, to uh, lessen that gap so that we learn quicker? Are there any ways that you know of? Yeah, so, so I would say there are, there are two, two ways. Uh, one is you learn a whole lot of a new field, right? You say, gee, you know, I, uh, I really wish I could play guitar, and you start and you spend six months and then you kind of sort of can play guitar. Okay? And now you can learn a new song which six months before you cannot. And at those time scales, so this is definitely not one trial learning, it's a lot of uh, repetition. And at those scales you're probably growing new branches, you're extending new trees and so forth, so you create not just new connections, not only that you learn new things, but you create an incredible potential for learning more. Right? You're creating a new milieu for learning. Okay, so that's one. And the second one is that you can go a little slower. Not all connections are one shot connection, right? So what you can do is instead of connecting neuron A with neuron B, if this neuron is very far from that neuron, 
you could connect neuron A with neuron C and neuron C with neuron B. Okay? And now what you have is that because of the complexity and the extent of these trees, although any one neuron is only connected to a small fraction, one in 10 billion, uh, one in 10 million, sorry, of the other neurons in the brain, uh, the chance that any two neurons are not connected through two other intermediate steps is very small. So it's a very easy combinatorial uh, computation to do. So two neurons might be uh, uh, very unlikely to be nearby, but if you allow to this, for the signal to pass through two additional connections, then it's very likely that it would occur. And that simply requires a little bit more, more mental gymnic. It's, it's not like a one-time, you know, quick thing, but it requires a little more effort. But that's also how um, emotional response, intent, and so forth can help. So there are so-called neuromodulators, different chemicals that your own brain uh, releases that facilitates those dynamics. Yes? So when we're talking about axons and dendrites making synapse, and learning new things, are we talking about those connections that are there that it's not active, per se, or are they being interactivated as you're learning? This is a great question. It could be both. There is actual evidence that the, uh, you know, those that I had uh, uh, schematized as little twigs, those are typically spines that are actually input uh, uh, little uh, uh, mushrooms that come out, uh, and uh, those actually twitch out. They're a little liquid. They're not really solid. They're membranes. They're a little oily, and they can twitch in and out. And those boutons that output on the axons can slide through the axons. So you can actually physically form contacts that were not there. But there are also plenty of cases where the contacts are there, but they're not the right chemicals to communicate, so they're silent. And when the two neurons are active at the same time, those new proteins get expressed and they become active. Okay, so so I, either either mechanisms can do the, can obtain the very same effect. Yeah, please. Uh, this, that's actually a good question. Not very much uh, data is known on the mechanism with respect to diet. There is a lot of empirical evidence that diet affects brain dynamics, but how so exactly is not known. Uh, for sleep, there is a lot more research. Uh, specifically, there are two main phases of sleep from this point of view. There is uh, dream sleep or RAM, rapid eye movement, and uh, 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 so-called slow wave sleep, which is uh, dreamless sleep. And uh, there is a lot of uh, rewiring that occurs in both phases. Uh, very different, with very different mechanisms, and people are still uh, arguing and uh, trying to figure out what the mechanism is. One of the big theories is that when you learn things during the day, which is where you have thoughts, you have going on your experience, etc., you tend to form a lot of synapses, and the risk in doing that is that you're filling in that sculpture, right? So it's losing meaning because you're going towards the more and more completely connected, and then when you sleep, you normalize that, you carve out all the synapses, you eliminate those synapses, and only the ones that are strong survive. So this is one of the main theories, for example. And so if you are sleep deprived, for example, you lose that opportunity and you lose information storage in the brain. And that seems to uh, uh, be true uh, in, uh, in flies, for example, and uh, in all animals that have uh, been known to sleep, which as far as I know is ever, everyone. But no animals are not, not even dolphins, right? Dolphins and, and whales who are, have to breathe, but they still sleep half a brain at a time. Yes. Um, the last thing you mentioned was uh, biomed experiments and intelligent machines. How is that going to help with like lesion studies, uh, brain damage, that kind of thing? Or is that part of your field? Um, it, I mean, it's not, it's not directly part of my field, but for sure, uh, if you create uh, uh, biologically compatible uh, computational devices, you are going to be able to interface them a lot more uh, easily and more directly with, uh, with the brain. So currently, all the brain-machine interfaces tend to be uh, peripheral. So uh, I think that there is great progress going on with artificial sensory modalities, artificial retina, artificial uh, auditory system, so-called cochleas, definitely artificial motor modalities like limbs and so forth. Uh, nobody has succeeded so far in creating, say, an artificial hippocampus, so that if you have a stroke in the hippocampus and you cannot store memories anymore, now we put this little implant and you can uh, work your way. But if we figure out the right connectivity and the right architecture, 
in principle you could be able to. You might not even need to implant it, right? As long as you have the right connection, something you keep in your pocket, for example. Thank you. Once we think about the future, I don't see why you have to drill holes in the skull. <laughs> um, perhaps there is time for one more question. Uh, and if not, not, so I would like to thank uh, Professor Ascoli for this most enlightening. This has been a real education for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, Professor Ascoli is available to sign a, a copy of his book. And uh, please uh, also remain and partake of cookies and uh, in lemonade. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, so there's no problem. <laughs> 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 <laughs>